right, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Mrs. Combs. And church, I sure have uh, enjoyed serving with you today and uh, to spending time with you. I was excited to see uh, one of our uh, folks this morning that was visiting with us come and accept Christ as Savior. Uh, she visited uh, and has, uh, has been approached by one of our newest members, uh, which uh, uh, I guess maybe has been a member maybe a month, maybe a month and a half. And uh, this lady's legally blind. And uh, she worked on this young lady and worked on her. She told my wife that she, that she had been invited over and over and over again. And she came this morning, wept during the preaching, wept her way down the aisle to salvation, wept her way to the baptistry, in the water, out of the water, and wept her way home. Amen. Now, when you cry, you really get saved, right? That's evidence of real salvation. But I'm telling you, whether you shed a tear or laughed or shouted or whatever you did, if you trusted Jesus Christ, you have been born again. Amen. And uh, that's the wonderful thing about salvation. You know, some people, they're overcome emotionally. Some people, I'll never forget a guy I witnessed to several years ago. I pulled my New Testament out, witnessed to him, went through the plan of salvation, uh, and, uh, and he bowed his head and accepted Jesus Christ. This guy had the, the no emotion, uh, the personality of a rock, never showed any emotion whatsoever at all. And so when he, and I thought, well, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get him excited about Jesus. So as soon as he uh, 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 finished praying to receive Christ, I showed him back there at Romans 10, 13, and I said, now, Mr. So-and-so, aren't you glad that you trusted Jesus Christ? Yes. And I said, the Bible promises us now that you're saved, your sins are forgiven, and now you have a home in heaven. Isn't that exciting? Yes, it is. And he never showed any expression at all of being happy. And now listen, now here's, what we, here's how you feel humanly speaking. You walk away and you think, now, Lord, did he really get saved? Well, first of all, it's none of my business whether he really got saved or not. That's between him and the Lord. I did my job and gave him the gospel. Now, I walked away from that door and I talked to him about coming and get baptized. And he said, uh, okay, I will. And I walked away from that door. I thought, yeah, right. That's, what, that's how I felt. Guess who was here the next Sunday morning? The guy that had zero, zero emotions about getting saved, zero emotions about exciting, get, about getting baptized. And he was the one that showed up at church and walked the aisle. I've had people that, that wept. I've had people get, that, that says, were so excited about being saved and I've never seen them since. So I, you can't, you just can't ever tell. And uh, you just have to keep loving people and keep working with people and listen, and keep praying for people and let God do the work. You know, I think God could do more in most local churches if, it's church, if church members would get out of his way and let him do what he wants to do in the church. Many times we try to do things for him. He doesn't need our help as far as convicting somebody. He can do all the conviction that needs to be done in a church service. And so church, if we'll just say, Lord, here I am. Use me however you want. I'm going to step aside and let you do whatever you want to do. And he said, thank, appreciate that. Because he can do in the heart something you and I cannot do. Amen. We can pray, but we cannot change a life. He's the only one that can do that. And he'd probably be changing a whole, more, a, whole, a whole lot more lives if we would just give him the opportunity to do so. Church, take your Bible once again. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 2 Timothy Chapter four. First Tim or First Chronicle or First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Hey, they're all in the Bible. They're all there. I just was quoting some Bible books of the Bible for you. So first Corinthians chapter fifteen and second Timothy chapter number four. Church, we're gonna go back tonight and do just a brief review. And then last week, I uh, talked to you about what steadfastness uh, is. And I want to take those 
uh, three items that I mentioned to you last week and take them one Sunday night at a time. I don't want to, to rush through this. I want to take each one uh, uh, over the next three Sunday nights and address each one. Last week, I spoke to you about being steadfast and how important uh, that we maintain steadfastness. I spoke to you last week and told you that steadfastness basically reveals itself in three ways. Number one, it's being constant in practice. Number two, being fixed in principle. And number three, being committed in purpose. Tonight, we're going to look at being constant in our practice. So take your Bible, if you would, first. Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58 out of love and respect for the word of God. If you can physically stand, would you stand with me tonight? And we're going to read this one verse. I tell you what, let's read two verses. I'll read verse 57 and then you'll read verse 58 with me. And then we'll go over to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And church, I gave you some background and history of the church. This was not a... Uh, uh, what we would consider an outstanding church at this point. Uh, they were in, uh, obviously in a city of paganism and immorality and, and uh, they were just completely surrounded by anti-God and anti-Christian practices. And Christianity was not a favorable uh, uh, religion at this time and, and uh, there was uh, all kinds of paganism and, and false Judaism and things. Everything you can imagine was running around. Christianity was not popular at this time. And uh, so here's a church that was started in Corinth, a very pagan and paganistic city. And Paul is trying to encourage them as a church. And he says, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ together. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now we're going to go back and review that verse in just a second, but I want you to turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now notice what he said to the church at Corinth, speaking to believers because he called them beloved and he called them brethren. And he said, be steadfast, that's one. Be unmovable, that's two. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, that's three. And then notice what he says, that know that your labor is not in vain. So four different aspects of that verse we dissected last week. We'll review those, but I want you to notice in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 2, Paul writing to Timothy, again, Timothy was from that that basically in that same vicinity, but more specifically, more toward uh, Ephesus and, and that region, and uh, likewise raised up in a very paganistic society and city and was surrounded. And Paul gave him some counsel, and here's what he told young Timothy. He said, preach the word. But this, that's not what I want to talk to you. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's this next thing he told him to do. Preach the word. Does your Bible say be instant? Now, wait a minute, that be instant doesn't mean like what we think instant is, like instant coffee, like quick about it. That be instant means be consistent, Amen. be constant. He says, be instant in season and how, church? Out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So twice now, the great apostle has written once to the church at Corinth, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And then he now writes to young Timothy who would be a preacher, who would become an outstanding pastor. And he told him, preach the word. But let me tell you something, young preacher man, be instant, be consistent in practice. Do not change your message when the climate of the day changes. Do not change your message when the morality of your day changes. Do not change your message when other churches change theirs. You be instant in season and out of season. And so church tonight, I want to talk to you tonight as we continue our study in steadfastness on that one phrase, being constant in practice. Father, 
we yield to you now to teach us from the Bible. And we ask that, uh, that your hand would be upon us and tonight that we might learn. And Father, we want to give you the glory and honor for all that you'll do in our hearts. We yield to you tonight to be the best Christian that we possibly can be. Now, we want to learn. So now, Holy Spirit, we literally cast ourselves into your hands and into your lap tonight and ask you to convict us, ask you to teach us, and help us not just to be hearers of the word, but doers as well. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, church, if you'll go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, what we know about steadfast and the word steadfast or steadfastness we find in the context of our theme verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Now, if you were not here last Sunday night, let me just quickly review. The word steadfast, if you're looking at that word in verse 58, the word steadfast to a church and to a believer suggests our posture as a Christian. In other words, how that we ought to present ourselves and how that we ought to look as far as a church. And it's how we define ourselves and present ourselves to others. Church, it's our attitude toward someone, Jesus, amen, and toward something that's the Christian life. Boy, I'm telling you, every pastor in America, if they could just get 100% of the congregation of the people they pastor loving Jesus and loving the Christian life, they could evangelize the city for Jesus Christ. And so that word steadfast suggests our posture as a Christian. And then we looked at the word unmovable, which suggests our position as a Christian. So we have a posture how we are to present ourselves before others, and then we have, we are told to be unmovable. It suggests taking a position and not moving off of that position. Now, folks, I want to say this, not boastfully, but I want to say this confidently. When you know you're right, do not change your mind. I said, when you know that you're right, do not change your mind. I don't care how many degrees that someone has on the wall or how smart that they say they are. If you know the truth of the word of God, you must not change. And so the word unmovable suggests a position as a Christian. It's where we stand and what we stand upon before others. It's our spirit toward truth and the word of God. It's our spirit toward service and the will of God. So we take a position. The third thing that we noticed about the verse is we're told to be steadfast. That's our posture. It says to be unmovable. That's our position. And then the phrase is always abounding in the work of the Lord. That suggests the passion that we're to have as a Christian. We ought to be passionate about who we are and what we are. You know, is, isn't it a sad day when the Muslims are more passionate about what they believe than what Christians are about what we believe? They're so passionate about what they believe that they're willing to take and, and, and go and spend weeks and months learning how to fly a commercial airliner so that they can crash it into, that's how committed that they are. That's how passionate they are about what they believe. It's a sad day in the church of, a, of an independent fundamental Baptist church when the Mormons and JWs are more passionate about what they believe than what we believe. And we're right. We have the truth. They don't even have the truth and they've got more passion about what they're doing. That always abounding church in the work of the Lord suggests our passion as a Christian. It's commitment, our commitment to doing our absolute best for Jesus Christ. It's our love for obedience. That's the plan of God. And it's our love for submission. That's the preeminence of Jesus Christ. So, so far we've learned stead, to be steadfast. That's our posture. He said, be unmovable. That's the position that we take. And then he says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's the passion that we have. Listen, he didn't say periodically abound in the work of the Lord. He said, always abounding 
in the work of the Lord. Christianity, church, is not a badge we wear. It's a life we live. It's who we are. It's not a hat that we put on when we walk out of the house. It's what we are. It's who we are. 24 days uh, or 24 hours out of the day, seven days a week, and then however many days are in a year. I'll stop right there with my Mississippi math. So we got a posture to uphold, a position to take, a passion to experience, and then notice what he says about the last thing. He says, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That suggests our pay. One day, payday is coming for God's people. Now, I must say to you tonight, if you're new to the Bible, when you get to heaven, God's not going to pay you off in this. Because in heaven, you know how much that's worth? Nothing. It's worth nothing in glory. God's going to pay you off in crowns. But one of the things I'm excited about for our people, and my prayer is for myself, I appreciate the crowns, but the thing I want to be paid off in more than anything than crowns is to hear the God of creation say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Hey, if I could just hear those words from my Savior. Listen, I appreciate the crowns. I appreciate all the other things. But let me tell you something. If I end everything by pleasing my Savior, it's been worth it all. But church, there is a posture that we're to take, a position that we're to hold, a spirit, an attitude, a passion that we're to have because one day the Bible says God's going to pay you off and he's going to pay off and I promise you, he's going to pay off everything coming to you based on what you've done for the kingdom of God and what I've done for the kingdom of God. You know, change around the church and in the church, unfortunately, in our day and time, the change has tended toward carelessness in the church. It's tended toward carnality. And I want to say to you, church, that so much is changing around us today. Casualness is abounding. Carnality is abounding. Listen, and it's affecting the spirit of the Lord's church in many, many cases. Tonight, I want to share with you in this preacher's perspective from the Bible, one of the more glaring changes that, that, that not only do I see outside the church, but things that we must not change inside the church. Because one of the glaring changes that I see going on, having been in ministry now 32 years, is the practices of churches and the practices of the church. Now, church, I want to say that when I refer to practice, I'm referring to the philosophy of ministry. So, preacher, where do we get our philosophy of ministry? We get it from the Bible. Amen. So when I talk about that, uh, the practices of the church, that we need to be constant in practice, we need to be constant in the philosophy of ministry. And that philosophy has to come from the Bible. So when I say that we're to be constant in practice, I'm referring to philosophy and ministry. Church, when I say that I am that we need to be constant in practice and uh, uh, in practice in the church, I'm talking about our presentation for Jesus Christ. In this preacher's perspective, I really, in my heart, at least I believe this. Whether it comes to pass or not, I don't know, but I believe it in my heart that prior to the coming of Jesus Christ, I believe the Lord is going to have a sweeping revival for that last group that's going to come into the family of God just prior to the trumpet sounding. Amen. Now, in my heart, that's what I believe. That's what I sure would like to see. And here's what I believe. Once that revival, once that begins to move, however long it's going to be, people are going to be looking for a real church. People are going to be looking. That Listen, they're tired of the pseudo-church style. They're tired of the pseudo-church and pseudo-Christianity. They will be looking for something real. They're going to be looking for a steadfast church is what they're going to be looking for. 
So when I say that we must be constant in practice, we must be constant in the philosophy of ministry. We must be constant in our presentation of Christ. And then church, we must be constant in our participation. The people and its participation. If we ever stop participating in what the church is supposed to be, then guess what happens, church? If we stop soul winning, we die. Amen. If we stop sending missions or working and sending missions money to missionaries, we die. If we stop teaching the Bible, we die. Amen. If we stop having church on a regular basis, we die. So listen, I'm saying that when I refer to constant in practice, I'm saying I'm referring to our philosophy of ministry, our presentation of Christ, and the participation of God's people in the biblical pattern of what a scriptural church ought to be. Church, it's clear, at least in my mind, it's clear in scripture that the church is to stay true to the biblical pattern regardless of the social or moral or political or religious climate of the day in which that church exists. It doesn't matter that the, we serve the same God today that Paul served. We serve the same God today that the believers in Corinth served. And Paul's letter to them was to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He said, church, posture yourself. Take a position. Have passion in what you do because one day there's payday coming for every member of the church. Tonight, church, I want to take just a few moments and just give you some things that are earmarks and that steadfastness uh, represents uh, in the church. Now, before we do this, we need to go take a look at something right quick. So I want you to take your Bible, go over to Matthew chapter 16. Go over to Matthew chapter number 16, if you would. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. Church, I think most of you would agree that in 2020, not just in America, but around the world, there is a definite Laodicean movement sweeping across the world today. It has overtaken many churches and may I say, even to a smaller degree, it's starting to creep into our independent fundamental Baptist churches. Amen. And our commitment to constant practice is what sets us apart as a Bible-based New Testament church. And listen, and we here, and the philosophy that we have at Trinity Baptist goes all the way back to the church that Jesus started. I'm gonna show it to you right here, Matthew 16, 18. I tell you what, go back up if you would to verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I the son of man am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist and some Elias and some Jeremiah and one of the prophets or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now listen to verse 18. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter. Now if you're new to the Bible and to the church, don't miss this now. He's not using Peter as the foundational uh, upon which he's about to build the next statement. He is just simply making a statement, Peter, you are who you are. And he says, but I want you to look at me. Upon this church, Jesus spoke of himself. I will build, help me with the next two words. Look up here at me. He didn't say, I will build a church. Did you see that? He didn't say that he would build some church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Church, do you realize that Jesus Christ has promised to perpetuate the church he started? 
with the posture that he wants it to take, with the position he wants it to stand on, with the passion that he left them to, to operate by, and, and with the understanding that one day there would be a payday. I believe without question that there is the remnant of the church that Jesus started. And by the way, he didn't start calling out the membership of the church in Matthew 16, 18. You go all the way back to Matthew chapter 4, he finds Simon and Andrew washing their nets as fishermen, and he came to them and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus began to call out the parts and elements and pieces of what the church would be built upon. And tonight, church, if we're going to be steadfast and true to my church that Jesus built, then we must be constant in practice. And these things that I am going to give you are going to go back and you will find that they are the strengths of the my church that Jesus built, not only from the day that Jesus started the church, but all through history, you will find steadfastness in these areas. So if we're going to be a steadfast church and true to my church that Jesus built, I want to say to you, first of all, church, that every church in history since Jesus started it has been strong Bible-based preaching. It has been strong in Bible-based preaching. You say, well, preacher, they didn't even have a full copy of the Word of God when the Apostle Paul, yeah, but what they had, they preached it. Amen. Amen. What Peter had, he preached it. What Paul had, he preached it. Listen, one of the earmarks of a, of, a, of a steadfast church, one who is postured, one who has a position, one who has passion, there's always been strong Bible-based preaching. Amen. One of the verses that we read at the beginning, 2, Peter chapter 4, or 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 2, Paul told Timothy, preach the word. Because it's always been a strong element of a local New Testament church that's steadfast, in the faith. Strong Bible-based preaching. I'm talking about preaching that uh, preaching from the pulpit and a church that preaches against sin. Amen. And they don't water it down because somebody in the church is involved in it. Amen. Listen, the pulpit doesn't water it down just because there might be someone in the church that if you say something about this particular sin, they might withdraw their tithe. Hey, I'm telling you, church, that tonight every church that God has used that's been steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord has always had strong Bible-based preaching. Preaching against sin, preaching about hell, preaching on separation, preaching on sanctification of the saints, preaching on the cross, preaching on the resurrection, preaching on the gospel, preaching about salvation by grace. Hey, there's always been preaching on the home the church, the second coming, the judgment seat of Christ, the tribulation, the final destiny of Satan. Amen. There's always been preaching on forgiveness, repentance, faithfulness. Listen, every steadfast church will always be built on strong Bible-based preaching. Always. And folks, <clears throat> may I say to you today, sometimes preaching like this, a lot of people can't stomach it. Sometimes we have people visit our church and they're not, they're not used to someone from the pulpit being, number one, loud, and number two, so adamant about what they're saying. You know why? Because too many folks out there, it's not preaching, it's suggestions. And people are sick and tired of suggestions. They're sick and tired of book reports. They're sick and tired of hearing what somebody else said or something they read in a book or something, some philosophy that, that, that they have. Listen, what people want today, they want to stop being tickled behind the ear and what they need is they need strong Bible-based preaching. And the church of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ that has been steadfast down through the ages has always been strong Bible-based preaching. But wait a minute, but also a strong presence of scriptural teaching. Always a strong presence of scriptural teaching. Just jot it down. You can read it in your spare time. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Paul writes here and says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, 
The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to do what, church? Teach others also. So the way that it works is the church is not only to be built and steadfast, if it's going to be steadfast, unmovable, it's to be a church that's strong, Bible-based preaching, but also strong, a strong presence of scriptural teaching. Church, a lot of if folks, churches are getting away from teaching doctrine anymore. I'm talking about Baptist doctrine. They're getting away from teaching the people Baptist distinctives. Why we're Baptists. They're getting away from teaching the very things. Why? Because they think that people don't want to hear that anymore. They want to hear some kind of message that is, listen, church, the church was never established that every message preached from the pulpit is to be an encouraging message. There's a sign, there's a charismatic church down close to where we live, and they all, they've got a billboard. They, they, they switch that billboard out all the time. Big old charismatic church. Big old billboard down there. And in about letters about this big, they got a picture of the church, they got a picture of the co-pastors, which are him and his wife. And big letters, this, this big, here's what it says. Come here, encouraging messages. Now here's what I think they're inferring. They're inferring that, you know what? There's too much of that yelling stuff down there at those independent Baptist churches. There's too much preaching about hell. There's too much preaching about sin. Come over here and we will encourage you. But you know when the preacher stands in the pulpit and he preaches about sin and that a person must turn from their sin to Jesus Christ to be saved, that is an encouraging message. Hey, when the preacher preaches about hell and says, listen, you don't have to go there. You can go to heaven. That's an encouraging message. You see, every steadfast church that's going to posture itself and hold a position and be passionate is always going to be based on Bible preaching and number two, scriptural teaching. We need to teach doctrine. We need to teach about the Trinity of God. We need to teach about the omniscience of God, the omnipotence of God, the omnipresence of God. We do need to teach about the love of God, but we also need to teach about the wrath of God. We need to teach about the fall of man and the plan of God for fallen man. We need to teach about the history of God's people. We need to teach about the comfort of the Psalms. and We need to teach the wisdom of the Proverbs. We need to teach the prophecies of God's men in the Old Testament. We need to teach the life of Christ. But you know, the Bible says <clears throat> that holy men of old, as they wrote, they gave us the scripture as they were moved to the Holy Ghost. And the Bible tells us that they wrote these things for our learning. I found out that I've learned so much more about God in the Old Testament as I have in the New Testament. And so every steadfast church that finds its roots in the church that Jesus started, the my church, that my church mentality is always built on strong preaching. Always built on the presence of scriptural teaching. Here's the third thing I want you to think about, church. It's always had a strong emphasis on reaching the lost. Amen. Always a strong emphasis on reaching the lost. We're getting away from that. Amen. Now listen, look up here, preacher. I love you. But we cannot be 100% right with God if we're not trying to reach the lost as an individual and as a church. We can't. We cannot be. It's not possible. For us to be right with God. You say, well, preacher, I, I just don't talk to people well. All right, then let me ask you to do something. Grab a handful of tracks, don't talk to anybody, and just go put tracks on doors somewhere. Do something! Listen, one of the earmarks of a steadfast church is Bible preaching, scriptural teaching, and an emphasis on reaching the lost. Listen, church, we must reach the lost by reaching the saved. You get that? Here's what. If we don't go out and encourage somebody to come and be our soul winning partner, then what's going to happen is the numbers are going to dwindle down. And church, can I say to you lovingly, that's exactly what's happened on Saturday mornings. We set a program that was working great, and the problem is the people that were once in the go group have stopped coming to the go group. 
Amen. You know why? Because so many people of God's people are putting other things in front of going and telling people about Jesus Christ. Church, can I say we have a program? There is a method to our madness. There's, we do have a program in place. We've got a group over here led by Brother Joplin. We call it the Go Group. They go out. We've got streets to go knock. They go talk to people. Then we have a group over here run by Brother Upshendik. It's called the Glean Group. They then take the prospects, the people that get saved from this group. Then his group, they go out and follow up. Maybe talk to them about getting baptized or, or maybe answer any questions. Then the prospects of people that say, hey, listen, we are looking for a church. Then they are passed on to Brother Reed's group, which is called the ground group. We have a system in place. But we'll never reach the lost until we first reach the saved. We've got to see God's people with passion about reaching the lost. Listen. Church, we are commanded not only to lead people to Christ, but to see them baptized. And not just see them baptized, but to see them taught. Amen. Think about this. Think about all the people it took to invest in your life for you to be where you are tonight. Right. <laughs> Some of the people that invested in my life <coughs> are with the Lord now. The two men that came to my door and knocked my door initially are both with the Lord. I've already told you about uh, Phil and Joanne Wells and, and their influence on my, they're still alive. They're aging, but they're still alive. But a lot of the people, the preachers was preaching the gospel the night I got saved with the Lord. Hey, can I say something to you? A lot of the people that are influenced my life in those early stages, some of them are getting on. They're going home to be with the Lord. But I've never forgotten them. Because I remember how many people it took that God used to invest in my life for me to be where I am. Listen, doesn't someone else deserve the same privilege you got? Doesn't someone deserve the same privilege that you got of all these people investing in them and loving them and nurturing them? Hey, folks, let me tell you something. There are people out there just like you that need what you got. But listen, if the church is going to be steadfast and passionate, it's going to have to have a strong emphasis on reaching the lost. Every church, if we're going to be part of the, my church that Jesus started, always Bible-based preaching, always strong scriptural teaching, always an emphasis on reaching the lost. And then here's something else you find in the Bible as well and down through church history. There's always been a strong com commitment to praise and worship in singing. Always been a strong commitment to praise and worship in singing. Do you know Jesus put so much emphasis on singing that after he shared his, the final supper with his apostles and was about to go be crucified, the Bible said they sang a song and went out into the night. Jesus Christ sang. Amen. I said, Jesus Christ sang. He said, well, preacher, I can't find a whole, minute, a whole lot of places in the New Testament where Jesus sang. Listen, even if you just found one, Jesus still sang. And just because there's only one reference didn't mean he didn't sing any other time. Do you realize that if God put everything in, in holy writ for you and I, you'd have to have a tow truck or a dump truck to haul your Bible around. I'm here to tell you tonight that the local New Testament church, a steadfast church, has always been committed to praise and worship in singing. That's the reason, church, that when you come to church, I always encourage you, get a hymn book, sing. You say, preacher, I can't carry a tune. That's not the issue. The issue is it's part of your worship. It's part of your praise to the Lord in song. Can I go ahead and say just something else right here? To get excited about the Lord, I don't have to have people amen, but we ought to amen. Yeah. Hey, ladies, ladies, you ought to bring your amen fan. Amen. We got two or three ladies that bring their amen fan. Listen, we need to get excited about this. Why? Because a steadfast church has a posture, it has a position, but it's this passion thing right here that if we're not careful, we're going to lose it. And if we lose our passion, we're going to lose the church. 
So there was always a strong and com a commitment to praise and worship in singing. I've told you many times a story about uh, uh, me knocking a door and a man asked me, he said, do y'all have a, 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 a strong music program? And I said, yes. He said, well, uh, do y'all do praise and worship? I said, oh, yes. He said, do y'all, uh, well, who's the praise and worship leader? I said, you're looking at him. He said, well, I thought you said that you were the pastor. I said, I am and the praise and worship leader. Sure am. And you know what? I think that's biblical. I think the pastor is supposed to lead the church in praise and worship. But there's always been a strong commitment to scriptural teaching, Bible preaching, emphasis on reaching souls, and praise and worship in singing. Singing unto the Lord. Folks, you know what, song, what music does to the spirit? When you read the Bible, you'll find out that when we get to heaven, there's going to be a lot of singing going on. There's going to be a lot of praise and worship going on in singing. So you know what we need to do here on this earth? We need to practice because we're going to be doing this forever and ever and ever. Hey, if we're going to be a steadfast church, we're going to have to have Bible-based preaching. We're going to have to have scriptural teaching. We're going to have to have an emphasis on reaching souls. We've got to be committed to praise and worship and singing. Listen, and here's something else. Don't miss it, church. There, are Every place that you'll find in the scripture, one of the strengths of the church was the atmosphere of fervent praying. It was a praying church. Every place you'll find the church constantly prayed over and over and over. And church, we've got to get back to regular praying. You know, the Bible talks about that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know, we have prayer meetings multiple times uh, <clears throat> uh, here at the church. We have them on Sunday mornings. We have them before church on Sunday night. We have a, a one-hour prayer meeting on Saturday morning from 8.30 to 9.30. This you say, preacher, I work. I can't be a part of that. Look up here at the preacher. Then pray at home. We have to to be fervent in praying. And prayer should not be something that we do at church, uh, folks. So prayer ought to be something that we do every day of our life. You see, if we're going to be steadfast, if we're going to be unmovable, if we're going to posture ourselves, if we're going to take a position and we're going to have some passion, listen, that steadfast church is, is based on Bible preaching, scriptural teaching, reaching the lost, praise and worship and singing, and fervent praying. Do you remember when Peter and Jesus had a, well, they had a lot of conversations, but in this particular conversation, Jesus looked at Peter and said, Simon, Satan hath desired you to sift you as wheat. But you know something exciting? Do you know what he said next? But I have prayed for you. I don't know about you, that kind of gives me chill bumps that God prayed for someone. God, the Lord Jesus Christ, prayed for Peter that he would withstand in the evil day. And church, I'm saying to you, we need to pray for one another. That's how important our time of prayer. Don't ever think that your prayer request is not important. Listen, in this church, we have day prayer change, night prayer change. Listen, you can call the church. We'll get you on the prayer sheet. We do everything we can to make sure that prayer is fervent. So you think about a steadfast church, Bible-based preaching, scriptural teaching, reaching the lost, praise and worship and singing, an atmosphere of fervent prayer. How about this one, church? How about a strong element of scriptural giving? A strong element of scriptural giving. We're told in the Bible that one of the ways that God finances his church is through the tithes and offerings of God's people. That's Bible. One of the ways that God says that he... Uh, 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 puts together a workforce in the church is by God's people giving of their time, giving of their talents. There's always been a strong element of scriptural giving. You know what God needs and desires more than he needs anything from you? Is your life, your will, 
and your willingness to commit to serve the living God. Always a strong element of scriptural giving. There's always been a strong spirit of selfless serving. Listen, we ought to have a waiting list that long of people wanting to teach Sunday school. We ought to have a waiting list that long of people wanting to be an usher. People wanting to serve somewhere. Pastor, is there any place that I can serve? Oh, yes. Yes, there's lots of places you can serve. We'll need to get you on the waiting, the waiting list. Yeah, we got 500 people waiting. Now, that's the way it ought to be, right? Unfortunately, in most independent fundamental Baptist churches, that's not the way it is. Sometimes in most fundamental Baptist churches, it's almost like pulling hen's teeth to get some people to serve anywhere. Amen. So we can shake our head right there. It is. Listen, the, a church that's steadfast, that is a descendant of the my church that Jesus started. There's always been a strong spirit of selfless serving. Let me give you one more thought here and then I'll wrap it up, church. There's always been a strong devotion of daily dying of its membership. I said daily dying of its membership. Last night, I was telling my wife, I got home I, this, this after preaching this morning, I sat down in my recliner. Man, I was tired. I didn't sleep very good last night. He said, oh. So it's, it's okay. I, I, I get it. You, you, you know, because if you tell me that, I'd probably do the same thing. So. But for some reason, I didn't sleep well last night. But have you ever had those nights where it wasn't necessarily that you were tired as much as you were wrestling with the flesh? And the flesh and the enemy wrestled you all night long? Amen. You say, he did? Where, preacher? Right there. Amen. He wrestled you all night long in your mind. He would not let you sleep. He wrestled. And listen, folks, if you haven't had that type of wrestling match, you will. If you're a born-again believer, there's going to be times you're going to wrestle with the, with the enemy. You're going to wrestle with the flesh. There must be a strong devotion to daily die. One of the things I have to do every morning I get up is I have to die to the flesh. Church, I, were, I used to remember Dr. Smith. But for those of you who are new to our church, Dr. Smith is our pastor emeritus. And I remember many times Dr. Smith talking about sitting here waiting to get to the pulpit to preach the word of God and the battles of the enemy that he would have in his mind and how the enemy would try to suppress him before he ever got to the pulpit. And I, I heard that and I, and I thought, Lord, I, I, I prayed for him and I, I didn't understand it until I became the pastor. Let me tell you something. Do you know what can go through a person's mind from right here to right there in a matter of a few steps? The enemy is very good about bringing and regurgitating all of your past within a few steps from here to there. I'm here to tell you, church, that if we're going to be a steadfast church, if we're going to posture ourselves before others, if we're going to take a strong position and be passionate about what and who we are and our purpose, we're going to have to be people in strong devotion to die daily to the flesh and die daily by resisting the enemy day after day after day. You see, these are the things, church, that have set Trinity Baptist Church apart for all these years. Bible-based preaching, scriptural teaching, a strong presence and emphasis on reaching the lost, a commitment to praise and worship in singing, a strong atmosphere of fervent praying, a strong element of scriptural giving and selfless serving and daily dying. Now here's the conclusion. Why? Why? Why Bible preaching? Why, pre, why are you up there yelling all the time, preacher? I'll never forget. I knocked on the door years ago of some folks that visited the church. Dr. Smith had kept preaching. Man, I, he preached on a message, and I mean, there was fire coming out of his nose. and he, I mean, it was, he was breathing like a fire-breathing dragon that morning. And so I went and visited this family. Knocked on the door. They came to the door. And in our conversation, they said, uh, we just got one question. I said, yes, what is that? They said, we just want to know, why was the preacher so mad? 
I said, no, 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 you got this all wrong. He wasn't mad. He was glad. He was happy. Oh. They didn't get it. They had no idea that what he was preaching, he wasn't mad, he was glad. He was happy because he was bringing the word of God to, the, to a lost and dying people. He was bringing the word of God to people that needed it more than they needed life. So why strong preaching? Why scriptural teaching and reaching the lost and praise and worship and singing and praying and giving and serving and daily life? Why constant in practice? Just jot these down, church, and I'm done. First of all, we must remain identifiable. Okay? We must remain identifiable. You'd be amazed at how many people don't even know what a Christian is anymore because most people don't act like one. Amen? Now, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about around the world. Most people can't identify one and, because they're not even sure they've ever seen one. But we as a church, if we'll follow this line of steadfastness, we must remain identifiable, church. Let me tell you why. Because you know what the enemy is very good at? Disguising what a church is. Yeah, that's the reason the Bible says, hey, marvel not. Satan, the enemy, can turn himself in, I'm paraphrasing, can appear as an angel of light. He's very good at disguising what a church is. And I think we've all figured out now that just because it's got church on the sign doesn't make it a church. A church has to meet certain criteria. A church has to have a posture, a position, and a passion. Its membership has to have a posture, a position, and a passion. Church, the reason that we must stay strong in these areas, we must remain identifiable because there are people, I know it's hard to imagine that there are people out there that are looking for Trinity Baptist Church, but they are. They're looking for a church that will posture itself and not change, but be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. They're looking for something exciting. Amen. But you know where a lot of people are going because independent fundamental Baptists are dead in the doornail? They're going to charismatics. You know why? Because at least there's a lot of hoop and a lot of law. Hoop, law, okay. Hoop and law. A lot of times they don't have the truth. And yet we got the truth and sure is getting late, preacher. Are you kidding me? It's only 720. He said, but but my bedtime, 10 minutes to my bedtime. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how? And we're all we're all this way. Nobody's nobody's. Isn't it amazing how when it's something that we really are committed to? We'll stay up and watch our favorite football team till 11 o'clock at night if we have to. Am I right? Yes, we will. Come on. Oh, come on, ladies. You know when those little chick flicks that we were that you like? We'll stay up and watch that. You'll stay. Listen, you'll watch Anna Green Gables till every one of them is expired, and I think it's about 16 hours worth. Come on, men. How many of you watched it? I had to. Come on. Yeah, thank you, Brother Garner, for being a man. And I, I watched it. And I'm going, I'm looking over there. My kids are crying. My wife's crying. I don't know how I got off on that, but we need to remain identifiable. That's what I was, that's what I was, we need to remain identifiable. And that's why then we need to have strong preaching and scriptural teaching and reaching the lost to remain identifiable. Number two, church, we must remain available. Amen. We must remain available. Go read the story of the Good Samaritan. You know what he was? He was available. We must be available to the lost. We must be available to those that are prodigals. We must be available because there's going to come a time in, the, in, in a backslider's life, they're going to need God. And you know who they're going to come looking for? You. So they're going to come looking for. That's the reason we need to make sure that we keep our posture and our position and we have passion about what we're doing. We must remain identifiable. We must remain available. Number three, we must remain credible. Amen. We've got to remain credible. 
We cannot lose our credibility. Church, what have we learned? If we lose our credibility, we lose our influence. If we lose our credibility, we lose our influence. We must remain credible to the, to the world and to, to those that one day will start looking for Jesus Christ. The apostles had some credibility. Now, Peter struggled a lot, but boy, I'm telling you, by the time Acts chapter 2, he had some credibility because he stood up and preached the word Amen. and 3,000 people got saved. You see, they had some credibility and they understood that they had, to, they, they had to remain steadfast. There must be a posturing, a position, and a passion. Why? They had to remain identifiable, available, credible. And then here's number four. We must remain favorable to the Lord. If we ever get off track, we're going to lose the favor of God. And if we ever stop being a soul winning church, we're going to lose the favor of God. If we ever stop preaching the old book and preaching against sin and preaching about hell, if we ever stop preaching about separation from the world or teaching of the word of God and stop reaching the lost or stop praise and worship and singing, and if we ever stop praying or giving or serving or dying, listen, not only are we going to lose our, identi our, identi our identity, we're going to lose our availability, our credibility, and worst of all, we're going to lose our favorability to God. We have to have God's presence. That's all about steadfastness. It's what this is all about. It's to remain favorable to the Lord. You know, <clears throat> I always love going and visiting folks when they say, boy, we came to church and I felt the presence of God. Man, I'm telling you, it, it, it encourages me so much to hear people say, when I came to Trinity Baptist Church, I felt the presence of God. Amen. You know what that is, church? That's a steadfast church right there. You say, what does one look like? I'm looking at it. It's you. That's what it is. That's the reason we must stay with strong preaching, scriptural teaching, reaching the law, singing, praying, giving, serving, and dying daily. Why? Because we have to re remain we have to remain identifiable. People need to know who we are, what we are, that our descendants, remember we read about our, about our ancestors in Hebrews chapter 11? That's our ancestors there that were killed and martyred and sawn asunder and stoned and fed the lions and walked about in deserts and caves. Those were our ancestors. But also, my church goes all the way back to Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell we must remain identifiable and available and credible. But church, we must remain favorable in the presence and the eyes of God. Because if we ever lose the favor of God, we might as well take Trinity Baptist off the sign and put Ichabod right. on there. Because that's what will become. The spirit hath departed. I don't know about you. You know what I vote? I vote steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, church.